Howdy nerds, this was supposed to be a short review, but ended up being commentary on pretty much the entire first arc. So spoiler alert for this old ass anime you should have watched already. Also, I made a few mistakes here and there, this was mostly due to discrepancies between the manga and two animes, with a little bit of me being an idiot sprinkled in, but I added text on screen with extra commentary and some corrections. Keep your eyes out for any fish by the way, Togashi seems to use fish as an excuse to draw dongs. 2011 was 12 years ago. 1999 was 12 years before 2011. That means that the 2011 anime is just as old to us as the 99 anime was back in 2011. We are growing old, dying slowly, autumn leaves drifting into, an abyss, of eternal, decay. Since Hunter x Hunter is supposedly coming back, assuming the corporate overlords don't steal the last of Togashi's delicious spinal fluid, I figured I would provide a review of Hunter x Hunter. My review will be better than all the others because it will contain my objectively correct opinions. The logic of the series is strange. In the manga and 99 anime the series opens with Green Goku being saved by a hippie named Kite who berates him for not knowing the specific territorial marking habits of maternal cat bear monsters. I would argue it's more strange that they let a chubby disgusting toddler roam through the woods unattended, but I guess Gon must be a dumb fuck for not knowing everything about every animal that lives on his home island. Kite apparently knows Green Goku's daddy and tells him about hunters, who are greedy shitheads that are all looking for something. This inspires Gonku to eventually abandon his fake mom and become a hunter, but she forbids this, which makes you think she might not be a complete moron, but then she makes an arbitrary rule that he has to catch this giant Junji Ito fish with insect legs in order to be allowed to leave. At first I assumed that she did this because she thought it would be impossible, but apparently Green Goku's hobo daddy also did it in the past, which contradicts her supposedly not approving of hobo daddy leaving and her supposed concern for Gon's well-being. Once Gon makes it onto the ship to head to the hunter exam we find out that the first part of the exam is just a bunch of random fuckers deciding to pass or fail people based primarily on if they like them. Gon, as well as a Japanese salary man and a twink, are the only people on the ship who don't get seasick, clearly proving they are powerful alpha chads that deserve to take 50 more tests to prove they can be hunters. I recorded the next part with my actual voice, I was originally going to do that for the whole video, but then I didn't. They land on the shore, and uh, the captain, because he's so impressed with them, gives them advice to go to like a tree or something like that, instead of going to the location that they're supposed to go to, which I guess is like a diversion, which, may, which doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah, so someone follows them over to this abandoned town, and he goes up to this old woman who's like the proctor for this test, or this whatever, this part of the exam. And he goes first. And they ask them the question. They ask them this question. Okay, if you had to like save someone between, like your lover or your mom, uh, who would you pick? And the the the, the guy who went ahead of him, he's like, oh, this, this fucking old bitch. She's gonna save mom because she's old. And so he answers that, and then he goes ahead, and he dies. He gets like eaten by magical fucking monsters or something. And uh, Gon and Karapika, they got super hearing, so they hear that, but Leorio doesn't. And Leori starts flipping the fuck out on the old woman <laughs> because he doesn't like he doesn't like either answer. So he goes fucking insane and starts threatening to like kill the old woman. Eventually, fucking Karapika's like, "Oh, we already passed Leorio," because the answer was to not give an answer. <laughs> but then. <laughs> That, that's that's correct that's correct they move on but then immediately after <laughs> immediately after they don't answer the question gone is like but what if we did have to answer that question and then the proctor who's listening to them still is like mm, yes sometimes you'll have to answer difficult questions I'm like Br bro you just fucking killed the guy because he supposedly answered it wrong what do you mean <laughs> it, it's it's weird after a bit more convoluted bullshit gone krapika and leari make it to the first part of the actual exam a number of important characters are introduced here the most notable of which being Hisoka the pedophile clown who ends up being a recurring antagonist, and Killua who is an overrated edgelord power fantasy character. There's also Tanpa, a fat sociopath who attempts to get the protagonists to shit themselves with laxatives. But Gon can smell that there's something wrong with the drinks and Killua is immune to poison because he's an ass. Ass. In. 
the applicants for the exam all receive numbers and start the first test, which is just them running. Everyone important passes this part, obviously. At the end they make it to a forest where a beaten up hobo shambles toward them and claims that he is the actual proctor and that mustache man is actually an imposter who actually beat the shit out of him and is actually a face imitating monkey that actually likes to eat human flesh. Okay. If you were overpowered why didn't they eat you then? The creepy clown man throws playing cards at both the hobo and the proctor, the hobo dies and the real proctor catches the cards. The real proctor gets mad and tells Hisoka that he'll be disqualified if he attacks a proctor again, as if 90% of the applicants weren't getting hunter licenses so they can do whatever the fuck they want. It's also stated that Hisoka was kicked out of the last exam for attacking a proctor, but was allowed to come back this year, so it clearly isn't that big of a violation. The next test is running. Again. But this time if you're too slow you get eaten by monsters. It's quite impressive how many negligent homicides the Hunter Association gets away with. They make it to a building in the middle of nowhere and the next challenge is for them to cook. The proctors are a fat guy who likes everything and an anime boob girl that doesn't like anything. Boob girl fails everyone, then an old guy shows up and tells her she's being too hard on them, so she decides they have to jump off of a cliff to collect some eggs. In the 99 anime there's a river at the bottom of the cliff, but in the 2011 anime there's just more negligent homicides. Everyone important gets eggs. They are yummy yummy, apparently. They all get on an airship where Netero, the old guy, bullies Gon and Killua in a game of keep away. Some character exposition happens for Killua in which it is very mildly implied that Killua maybe doesn't want to be an ass ass in even though the way he talks about it is still edgy and unremorseful. Finally, we reach Trick Tower. This mini arc is the first good thing that happens in the series. The applicants are dropped off on top of Trick Tower and have to enter it through randomly placed false tiles, this creates the possibility of randomized teams, but favors existing teams since you're more likely to fall through the same tile if you're already standing next to each other. Upon entry every applicant gets an electronic watch that allows them to vote on things. This is made more difficult by that fact that the shithead Tanpa ended up as a fifth member of the protagonist's group. In every situation where there's a vote Tanpa is as much of a dickhead as possible. In the first real challenge they are confronted with a group of prisoners who they will compete against in a series of improvised challenges. They are competing for time, each point counting as an hour worth of time limit to complete trick tower for the protagonists and each point counting as years off of their sentence for the prisoners. Since there are five members on either side whoever wins the majority of the one-on-one -on -one matches wins. This is a pretty good way to establish motivation for both sides while also incentivizing the prisoners to stall since real time passing also takes time off of their sentences. The array of matches are varied and interesting, Tanpa pusses out of a hand-to-hand -hand death match, Lei Arya is manipulated by a hot psychiatrist, Kora Pika has to deal with a coward drug dealer that kills time by playing dead for most of the match, Gon has to pick a candle that will last longer than his opponent's candle, but his is infused with gunpowder and burns much faster despite being longer, but this has the adverse effect of making it harder for his candle to go out, so he's able to run over and simply blow out his opponent's candle. For the side characters we see Hisoka killing the exam proctor he had attacked the prior year, as a hunter and examiner Togari, the knife boy, should know how to use Nin, but it doesn't appear that Togashi had thought of Nin as a concept at this point. Everyone important passes and not much else interesting happens with the exam until we reach Civil Island. In this contest each prospective hunter has a badge with a number on it. They randomly get assigned some other contestant's number. Their number badge counts as 3 points for them, their target's number badge also counts as 3 points, but any badge that isn't yours or your target's number only counts for 1 point. So your objective is to find a random enemy contestant to collect an item from them while also keeping your own complimentary item that other contestants are hunting for and you don't necessarily know who your target is or who's hunting you. If this sounds familiar that's because the forest of death from Naruto stole that shit. It's not the only thing Naruto stole either, the Uchiha clan. Sasuke's dead family and the Shoringan are also based on Kura Pika, the Gurta clan and the Scarlet Eyes respectively. Sasuke's design is even based on Hiei from Yu Yu Hakusho, another Togashi manga. While this may seem like plagiarism, Togashi and Kishimoto are apparently pretty cool with each other, and it's not like Hunter x Hunter isn't highly derivative itself. Though I would argue that part of Togashi's narrative directly critiques and subverts shonen tropes which makes the derivation in his story more appropriate. You may have noticed that I'm making fun of the series a lot less and taking my description of the writing more seriously. To put it bluntly, this is because the series starts off with shit writing. 
Some people try to justify this as necessary for the sake of establishing what appears to be a basic shonen for the sake of eventual subversion, but I disagree. I think it just took Togashi a while to settle into the writing of Hunter Hunter. A lot of the setup simply wasn't necessary or could at the very least have been done much more quickly. The uninteresting storytelling in the beginning of the series also reemerges in later arcs, sandwiched between some of the best anime arcs I've ever seen is some of the most mediocre or outright awful writing. Getting back to the story, Zivil Island is primarily the story of Gon hunting Hisoka. Having drawn Hisoka's number Gon anxiously ponders how he could possibly overcome such a vastly superior opponent. We're introduced to the first inklings of Gon's approach when he sees Pockle, the archer boy, sneak up on his target and knock him out using a poisoned arrow. Personally, I find this part completely unnecessary. Gon acts like this is some major epiphany toward his objective, but all he really learns is that he should use stealth and maybe have a backup plan if stealth fails. Even though Green Goku is pretty smooth-brained I feel like he should already know this since he's a stinky animal child. The follow-up to this is a little more poignant, Gon sees a bird catch a fish when it leaps from the water to try and eat a bug and determines that the point in which your target is most vulnerable is when it's striking its own target. Little green dude managed to squeeze a coherent thought out of his one brain cell, this is a pretty brilliant idea since Hisoka's obsessive bloodlust gives him tunnel vision on whoever he's trying to kill. After following Hisoka around for a while Gon almost has to step in and ruin his plan because the clown happens to run into Lei Arya and Crap Pika. Fortunately the twink is able to persuasion check Hisoka by giving him their extra badge and confirming that none of their important badges are Hisoka's target, though not killing them blue balls Hisoka and he gets murder horny. Unable to tame his raging boner, Hisoka decides to kill the next person he senses, this gives Gon the opportunity he was waiting for as he snags Hisoka's badge right as the clown slaughters an ugly jobber. Gonku runs away, is poisoned by a dude in a weird outfit, then Hisoka kills that guy and gives Gon his badge back as well as his own badge because Gon isn't strong enough to satisfy his clown boner and he has so many badges that losing his doesn't even matter. Gon then decides to throw a fit and tries to give him his badge back because he wants to win fair and square, so Hisoka socks him in the mouth and tells him that he can give the badge back when he's capable of punching back. I understand Gon likes to work hard and doesn't want to feel like he was handed anything, but this mentality annoys me a bit since he's the subject of a considerable amount of nepotism. I mean, he's the son of one of the most powerful hunters in the world who sets up an entire area for him to explore and his best friend is part of a family of assassins who are also among the most powerful fighters in the world. Getting back to Zivil Island, the time limit is quickly approaching and Lei Arya still doesn't have enough badges because he's a scrub and needs Gon and Kora Pika to carry him. Seriously though, if not for Kora Pika Lei Arya wouldn't even have his own badge. Regardless, they manage to track down Ponzu, Lei Arya's target who's a teenage girl with a goofy hat. She just so happens to be in a cave full of snakes. Ponzu has bees that live in her hat and help her when she's distressed. If that sounds familiar it's because Naruto stole that too. Also, just make a mental note here that Ponzu's bees are supposed to attack anyone nearby whenever she falls or screams. It will be important later. They use sleeping gas to knock everyone out except for Gon, because apparently he can hold his breath for a really long time. Seems a little convenient, but it's not that bad I suppose. Gon then robs Ponzu of her badge and gives it to Lei Arya. That means that neither of the badges Lei Arya has were earned by him. His badge was stolen and retrieved by Kora Pika and his target's badge was given to him by Gon. Now that Lei Arya has been carried to the finals we get a nice subversion of the Dragon Ball Tournament arc trope where instead of progressing to the finals by winning you get knocked out of the tournament by winning and progress by losing, with only one person failing to become a hunter and all other contestants getting their hunter's license. The rules for the matches are that it's one-on-one -on -one combat, so others can't interfere, and you win when your opponent admits defeat. Knocking out your opponent doesn't matter and killing your opponents will disqualify you. The match isn't over until someone admits defeat or gets disqualified, or dies even though that doesn't make sense, but we'll get into that in a bit. In the first match we get to see how stubborn Gon is as the ninja man brutally beats the child and breaks his arm. Hanzo, the ninja bald boy, is provided as being the third strongest member of the applicants behind Hisoka and Gitargaka, so Gon really never stood a chance. This could have gone a lot worse if the ninja guy was an actual bad guy because he could very easily have permanently maimed Gon. Fortunately One Punch Man decides to forfeit, meaning that Gon wins by default, but is knocked out for the rest of the matches. Ninja Man Boy then beats up Pockle who pusses out immediately, so now the ninja is out. Pockle has to fight Killua next, 
but Killua thinks Pakal is so bitched here that he isn't even worth fighting and forfeits. This stupid and convenient choice from Killua puts him in a situation where he has to fight Gutter Butter, who's actually his brother in disguise, Ilumi. Ilumi does some hypnosis bullshit and Killua has a panic attack and forfeits. The next match is Kora Pika vs Hisoka, which seems like it sounds like it should be pretty interesting, but in the 2011 anime they just gloss over it like it barely happened. In the 99 anime they actually fight and Killua unsheaths the weird stick things he carries revealing that they're actually swords. The scene is badass, but not canon. Hisoka then breaks one of the swords with his playing cards, which doesn't make sense right now, but will later on. They fight for a bit until Hisoka tells Kora Pika something about spiders which causes him to shit himself and forfeit. The spider is apparently a common moniker for a group of an extremely powerful terrorist group called the Phantom Troop, who all have spider tattoos. They had Achid Kora Pika's family and so Kora Pika is immediately interested in any information about them. I'm not sure why this means he has to forfeit, but whatever. During the next match Hisoka says something else to Botaro, the old fuck martial artist, which causes him to also shit himself. Which is just straight up plot contrivance. Togashi wanted a specific outcome, but needed worthless jobbers to pick off in the finals, so he awkwardly forced some of the encounters to go in a nonsensical direction. Realistically Hisoka would have either not been interested in fighting Botaro and would have ended up fighting Leiarita, or would have completely demolished him. It's revealed later that Hisoka is pretending to be a member of the Phantom Troop which justifies him knowing about them, but what could he possibly know about this random ass old man that he was able to force him to forfeit? I call bullshit. Botaro then has to fight Leiarita, but hypnotized Killua murders Botaro just as the match starts. Which leads to Killua being disqualified and Leiarita becoming a hunter by default. Once again getting carried to victory. And this time it doesn't even make sense. I didn't mention this before, but Leiarita tries to step in when Gon is being brutalized by Hanzo, however, he's warned that if he steps in, Gon will be disqualified, so, why the fuck is it that when Killua interrupts his match and causes him to win by murdering Botaro that Leiarita isn't disqualified? The annoying thing about this is that it would only take one tiny change for this to make sense, that being Killua murdering Botaro just before the match begins. Since killing causes disqualification this would still disqualify Killua, but having it not occur during the actual match would presumably have no effect on Leiarita. I guess maybe the intention matters, Leiarita was clearly planning to help Gon, but Killua murdered Botaro because of Illumi brain fucking him. That definitely feels like a cop out though, Killua and Leiarita are clearly part of the same group and are obviously aligned prior to this and Killua only harms Leiarita's opponent, so this definitely should have resulted in Leiarita being disqualified. Everyone important and also Pakal gets hunter's licenses. Killua has a mental breakdown and goes home to his ass ass in family, which triggers Gon into breaking Ilumi's arm. Ilumi tries to murder Gon, but is stopped by Hanzo, Kora Pika, the examiners, and Leiarita was also there. Ilumi continues to talk about murdering Gon because Killua's sense of friendship with him is inconvenient, but Hisoka wants Gon to grow up big and strong so that he can fight him to satisfy his murder boner and forbids Ilumi from killing him. Ilumi then considers doing it anyway, but sees Hisoka creeping in the shadows nearby and fucks off. Yay. Now everyone, but Killua has I can do what I want cards. Now we just need to rescue Killua and he can cheat to get one later. That's the end of this video. Tune in next time to see my riveting review of the Killua's emo family arc and the York New City arc.